The IPS Academy provides online courses from some of the best instructors out there on mental health, personal development, lifestyle, nutrition, relationships, mindfulness, improving your life quality, etc. Each course we offer has been made in collaboration with an instructor who has also been a guest here on the Inner Picture Stories podcast. Have a look to see if there's a course to your liking, read the full course descriptions and check out the thousands of positive reviews from students who have taken the course by going to innerpicturestories.com slash academy. With that, let's dig into the interview. Welcome to the Inner Picture Stories podcast. My name is Jelis Vaas, your host and the founder of Inner Picture Stories, the educational platform on life. I hereby invite you to come on a journey with me. In each episode, we will dive into the life of an inspiring person seeking lessons of wisdom about life and the world we live in. Answers that you can take away and use in your own life. It's true that no one ever said life would be easy, but it's also true that no one ever said you had to do it alone. So get ready and let the journey begin. You know, the thing we forget is that there are tons of safe, loving, compassionate people out there. All feelings are valid. There's just healthy or unhealthy ways of expressing it. Do not try to fight this on your own because it is too big. It is too big. And you can't fix an unhealed brain with an unhealed brain. This is episode 005 with Paul Kilmartin. Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yelis Vaas speaking. Hope you're all doing well today. And thank you for tuning in here at the Inner Picture Stories podcast. This episode goes deep, very deep into subjects that need to be talked about way more. Depression, suicide, feelings, and emotions. For anyone who is struggling with any of those issues or known someone who is, please keep listening to this episode because there is some truly valuable advice and wisdom being shared here that can and will help you enormously. Before I talk more about this episode and our guest Paul Kilmartin, I just want to say a quick thank you to one of our listeners who wrote a five-star review. This is from Sukran who writes, inspiring, brave, different, strong. These are the first words that come to my mind. Sukran, many thanks for that review. It's uh, very much appreciated and I'm sure this episode will live up to those words too. To everyone, if you find any value in in the episodes uh, here on the podcast, it will mean so much to me and for the sake of spreading this wisdom from our guests even further, if you could write a small or big, whatever takes your fancy, review on iTunes or Stitcher. Now, onto the interview, I interviewed Paul Gilmartin, who is an American stand-up comedian, a television personality and host of the popular podcast The Mental Illness Happy Hour, where he interviews people about mental illness and about the many different struggles and battles we all face and have in our lives. Like I already said, this episode goes deep down into these subjects and into the importance of talking about them. Some of the things we talked about are where Paul thinks unhappiness comes from, when he knew he really needed help, how it felt for him opening up for the first time about his feelings and emotions, advice on what to look for when searching for a good therapist, steps he recommends for dealing with depression, the importance of humor and laughter, and much more besides. With all that, I hope you enjoy this episode with the one and only Paul Gilmartin. Paul! Welcome to the show, and I'm very excited to have you here. And again, thank you for making some time to do this interview. Uh, before we start with the main subjects of the show, I like to start with a couple of starting questions that I ask all my guests here to warm a little bit up. And the first one is, do you have any morning routines that you feel contribute to your happiness or something that you do that helps you to start your day off on the right note? Absolutely. Um... The first thing I do is uh, make my bed, which I just started doing uh, a couple of months ago. It's just kind of a visual reminder to take care of myself. The other thing I do is, um, so then I take my meds, I jump in the shower, and as soon as I get out of the shower, I uh, meditate for 20 minutes, and then I say, uh, then I stretch a little bit. 
And then I say um, uh, a little prayer yeah. to uh, try to remember that I'm not in control of everything. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, That's important. And, and though that that's basically uh, the way that I that I start my day every uh, every morning. Uh, just on a meditation, do you have any? Do you use any application, or is it just that you sit down and listen to anything? Or I, I sit down and I um, I was taught um, transcendental several years ago, but a lot of times, I, you know, I don't even say my mantra. I'll uh, you know just focus on my breath. And a lot of times my mind is just jumping from one thing to the next and, uh, you know, 20 minutes will have passed and I'll realize, man, <laughs> I was just jumping from one thought to the next. But that's still fruitful because it lets me know, OK, maybe I'm in a state of agitation. Maybe there's some fear going on. Uh, maybe there's something that's unresolved that I need to make peace with or um, work on, you know, maybe maybe get something done to uh to help calm my mind so those are the those are the big ones um just one more question on meditation though because so many people today are well many people are doing meditation and what what's the reason like what does it do for you it helps slow my mind down it helps it helps with that kind of internal clock that i had always had in my head making me feel like like I was three steps behind everybody else on earth and, and I couldn't really be in the moment because I just am not doing enough and I don't have enough and I am not enough. And meditation kind of helps me realize, get in touch with the, uh, the, the, the thing that Eckhart Tolle refers to as the observer. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, It's very easy to just have a myopic vision of your life because you're so you because you don't know how to step back and see that this universe is not all about you. It's about interconnectedness. It's about just being as much as it is about doing. And so meditation helps me kind of be the observer, observe my thoughts And uh, to remind me to not get caught into that trap where I accept everything uh, that I feel as reality. Unhappiness. What do you think is the cause of unhappiness in most people? Um, I think in an, an inability to surrender to what is and be present in the present moment. I think 90% of it. Now, I'm excluding something where somebody has clinical depression. Yeah, or something. But, yeah, sure. But it's more about your personal thought, what it will be. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an inability to um, make peace with the present moment because 90% of the present moment is... Are, are things that we have no control over and the illusion that we can control the things that we don't like leads to most of the insanity in the world. The only thing we can control is our reaction to it. Yeah. And if I'm present and if I can get some distance between myself and my insecurities and fears, well, then I can usually pause before I react in a, in a way that that isn't ideal. I can usually, um, not take things personally. I can usually view other people as, um, just as flawed as I am and I can give them a wide berth. And if it is a situation where I need to speak up, I meditation kind of allows me that, that pause because my mind is slowed down a little bit, that pause to put together my thought of how I'm going to share my thoughts with this person, to try to do it in a way that's diplomatic, but isn't either hostile um, or apologizing. Appreciation, Paul. What do you do to remind yourself of your appreciation of life? Well, if I don't slow down, I can't appreciate it. Um, yeah. if, if, you know, I think being of service really helps me. It reminds me that I'm not the only one who is stressing out or suffering. And 
And then I can be grateful about the meal that I'm sitting down to. Self-care is really, really important for me. I'm living on my own now. My wife and I split up after being together for a long time and I've never lived on my own before. And it's, it's forced, it's kind of forced me, uh, you know, because, uh, now I'm in charge of everything about my apartment and my food and every decision I make. So it's, I'm more kind of faced with how, how can I take care of myself? And, you know, one of the things is, Four or five nights a week, I cook for myself. I don't rush through it. And when I eat, mm-hmm. I don't have the TV on. I don't look at my computer or my phone. And I just appreciate the meal. And in those moments, I am usually able to remind myself that this is not a given, that I am not entitled to food. I'm worthy of food, but I'm lucky yeah. to have food. It's amazing that and, you're doing that because it's true. Like so many people take that for granted that you can eat food right now. And when you just sit down and eat it without yeah. having your thoughts going to anything else, but the food, it just, it feels it's good. That's why I start is I just say, you know, first of all, thank God I'm able to afford. <laughs> also, I mean, yeah. Thank God I live in an apartment where I can cook the meal. Yeah. Um, thank God I have the time to do this. Uh, thank God I have the recovery to be able to see how important this is. And, and thank God um, the universe has blessed me with living in a, a country where I can be food secure. You know, I, I honestly think that life is all about appreciation. And if you can't uh, take a step back and actually appreciate what you do have, you're going to take all of that for granted. It really is. And so how do we, how do we get into that perspective in a way that isn't just fleeting? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the real issue. Do you have any answer to that? (laughs) Well, for me, fortunately, um, and this sounds funny, but fortunately for me, my alcoholism Mm -hmm. and my drug addiction forced me to get help. And through getting help, I was able to see how warped my view of myself, my interaction with other people and my view of the world was, how trapped in the past and the future I was, how I was making everything about me and how important service was. And so once I started incorporating those things into my life, um, gratitude just kind of naturally came as as a byproduct. And I feel, I truly feel that gratitude and forgiveness are not two things that you can just intellectually say, I'm going to go to this. I have to be in an emotional state where I can feel gratitude, where I can feel forgiveness. And that, that is a beautiful thing because that brings me peace. Paul, with that last question, I am super excited to go and dig within the main subjects why I wanted to have you here in the show, and mm-hmm. which will be about some of the challenges you have faced and so many among us come to face as depression and anxiety, loneliness, suicidal thoughts. And these are all subjects that are way too less spoken about and should be talked about so much more. So I'm very happy that you're taking the time here to sit down with me and talk a little bit about them. But Thank you. Yeah. Besides being a stand-up comedian, you're also the host of the podcast, The Mental Illness Happy Hour, which is, by the way, a great name. And <laughs> you interview artists. By the, way, yeah. by the way, I came up with that name while meditating. Some of the best ideas come to me uh, while I'm while I'm meditating. Yeah, while well, you're sitting and still and having no thoughts. While I'm sitting yeah. still, and this is another thought that that I kind of like that came to me while I was meditating um, uh, two days ago, is I, I'm always trying to think of ways that I can communicate coping skills, what I get from them, um, why people should try them. And I had this image that meditation, um, if you think of your, your daily life as you're in the ocean, you're treading water, and you don't see land anywhere, and you begin to kind of panic and feel overwhelmed and think, how am I going to do this? How am I ever going to do this? Meditation for me is remembering that if I just stop swimming for a second, that I'm actually able to stand on a sandbar and the and the water is only up to my neck yeah meditation is 
yeah, it's incredible what it does to you. And yeah. I've only been getting into it more seriously just recently, but the effects, I well, I do definitely feel the effects of it. But you interview on your podcast uh, artists, doctors, therapists, psychologists to people that you've met in your life, and you interview them about your challenges and the struggles that they have faced in life. And mm -hmm. you talk about the human side of human beings, about feelings and emotions. And I like to, first of all, uh, start off with a question, uh, one that you probably have been asked many times, so I apologize for that, but how did the mental illness happy hour started? What was the reason behind the creation of it? I had gone off my meds because I thought I didn't need them anymore. And I thought if I do need to be on them, I'll know within a month or two whether going off them was a bad idea. And I felt great for about four or five months. So I thought I was in the clear. And then I started feeling uh, really sad. Um, my perspective on my life was uh, kind of hopeless. And I began thinking about suicide. And, and then it occurred to me, oh, my God this is the depression coming back. And I believe that depression is a real thing. I go to therapy. I see a psychiatrist. I pray. I meditate. And I was fooled by it. And I thought somebody has to talk about this subject in a way that that is compelling mm -hmm. or, you know, at the very least, you know, that doesn't feel like they're sitting through a, a class. Yeah. Right. And, and I thought, because it's not being talked about the way I would want to listen to it. Yeah, are, for sure. You know, it needs, you know, an occasional sick joke. It needs, but not in place of the vulnerability, in addition to the vulnerability. Exactly. Yeah. And so that I thought, you know, I'll give it a shot. And, um, you know, the template for it really was the support groups and the honest conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations I have with, with people in there. And so I thought we'll just open it up to, all the struggles in our life and we won't be the solution to it. We'll just be kind of the, the waiting room, uh, <laughs> for, for the help. I, I can be a cheerleader for help. I can let people know they're not alone yeah. and maybe that will bring them some comfort. Yeah, it definitely will. Where did things actually started going down the road for you? What do you mean? Like when were things not going that well in your life anymore? As an adult? Yeah, in your life, when were you feeling like depression? When was that coming for you? Like, Well, I think I was even depressed as a child, but, you know, kids have kind of a resilience uh, to mm -hmm. them. And I really consider when the problem became obvious to me was in my mid to late 30s where self-medicating with alcohol was no longer um, really working. And my anxiety and my fear and my selfishness were just getting worse and worse. Um, my suicidal thoughts were getting worse and worse. And one of the reasons I knew something was wrong with me was because I had um, everything that society tells you you need to be happy. I had a house, a wife, a job, recognition, money, time to spend it. Um, and I was suicidal and I didn't realize it's because I was making everything all about me. Yeah. And it is a prison of your own making. I wasn't connecting to other people. I was my higher power was the pursuit of my own pleasure. And, you know, while you may get occasional um, jolts of pleasure from that, it's it's uh, the time in between those moments of excitement are miserable. And, and so I got help and that, that really helped change my perspective and see that this is, there's a spiritual component to feeling emotionally healthy that can't be overlooked. When did you actually knew that you really needed help? Because for many people, they know that something is not quite right, but still they don't go and seek help for, for many, it's only until they hit like the very bottom that they start to realize that they need help. When did you realize that you really needed help? When I couldn't stand, I remember looking at dishes in the sink and thinking I will kill myself 
before I wash those. That's how much of an effort everything had become. And the only thing I had to look forward to was getting drunk and getting high at night. And I knew that was the very thing that was exacerbating my depression, but I couldn't get out of it. And, um, the psychiatrist that was seeing me, um, told me that, uh, I needed to, uh, stop, uh, drinking and doing drugs, you know, at least for long enough for him to be able to make an accurate assessment of me. And I couldn't, and he suggested a uh, support group for me. And, um, I didn't know whether or not it was going to work. Um, and lo and behold, it did. And it helped me address pretty much every problem, uh, in my life, except for, you know, the biochemical problems, which the psychiatrist helps me with. Um, you also, you went to a therapist as well, right? Or yes, yes. And I, that's the other thing I should add. Uh, a therapy also, uh, helps. I just have a question, um, about that. How is it for you the first few times going to a therapist and, and opening yourself up about those feelings? It was, it was a little terrifying that the first time I went was in my twenties. So I actually went back to therapy when I, uh, started getting sober. So it wasn't a new thing for me, but early on, I I was lucky enough to have the thought in therapy that if I hold back the stuff I don't want to talk about, I'm going to be wasting my money in here. <laughs> and as terrifying as it was, That's a good way of looking at it. Of, yeah, I kind of spilled the beans yeah. and, and I was glad I did because we were able to make headway pretty quick. And, and she was able to, uh, help me see really how unhealthy my family was. And that helped me begin to set boundaries and, but I still didn't really give weight to the stuff that happened to me until, until I was, 48 years old. And that's, that's how many layers of the denial and the playing the roles we're given as a family member can, can go on for. The reason why I actually asked that question was because for men, it's always a bit harder and I'm not saying it's not hard for girls either, but you will much rather see a girl open up about her feelings than a guy. And yeah. there are many guys who simply don't go to a therapist or to someone because they feel that they shouldn't talk about their feelings mm-hmm. or that talking and showing emotions is weak, which yep. is, of course, further from the truth as it's courage in its greatest form. But many guys, and again, this goes for girls too, of course, but many just have the wrong idea about what the reaction will be when you show your true emotions to someone who wants to be there for you. And, Absolutely. And I'd just like to ask you, what is opening yourself to your therapist and opening yourself to other people about your problems? What has that showed you doing this? That there's that there are good people in the world, that there is love and compassion in the world. Definitely. Uh, very often, you know, for those of us that need therapy, the reason we need therapy is because the family unit we came from didn't help us identify what right. we were feeling and they didn't let us know that all feelings are valid there's just healthy or unhealthy ways of expressing it oh, and that's so, good to say, yeah. yeah so um it's i've learned who, you know I've, I've begun to get a sense of uh who is safe to open up to um who isn't safe to open up to you know you cut for me i kind of test the waters if i you know if i bring up something that's just slightly emotional of a subject if that person doesn't respond with any kind of uh interest or enthusiasm i don't push it i don't go beyond that yeah and i think a lot of times people go to and open up to the wrong person and, and then, then they think oh nobody wants to talk about this <laughs> that's now, yeah totally yeah, true a big part of recovery is finding your people yeah and yeah oh and this happens so many times that people just open up to the wrong to the wrong people and then they just um think that everyone will react back like that yeah it reinforces what they were told as a kid you know maybe not uh out loud but what w- the message they were given uh, which is that you you don't really matter your feelings don't really matter yeah to someone who is considering to go to a, a therapist are there any words of advice you can give to that person what they should look for in a therapist or something else out of your experience or out of the experience of any of your guests that you had yes 
Um, if you don't feel compassion in that person's eyes, uh, find another therapist. It's very important in therapy to feel safe and to feel empathized with and tell them once you find a person who you feel that with, then open, open up to them and don't, don't hold anything back. That's, that's worked for me. That has worked for me. Did you went to, um, just one therapist or did you try? Oh, I've done, I've done multiple therapists. And the other thing that I do is when I say don't hold back anything, if I'm feeling anger at my therapist in a session, I'll say, I'll do it diplomatically, but I'll say, you know, some anger is coming up for me. You know, instead of saying, I think you're a phony bitch, I'll say, you know, there's a part of my brain that feels like, you know, maybe you're, you're not being real with me just because I'm paying you and this is what you think you should say. And then we'll talk about that because everything that pops into your head can be fruitful in therapy. And once you realize that therapist is there for you, they got, they didn't get into this because they're annoyed by people or they want to judge people. They got into it because they have compassion and insight that they want to share with people. Now, that being said, there are some terrible therapists out there and you may experience uh, one, maybe even two as you look for the right therapist. But that doesn't mean that all of therapy is like that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you could recommend listeners besides a therapist that has helped you greatly into dealing with your struggles? Support groups. If you have an addiction or some type of trauma uh, or or emotional neglect, you know, even a, a home where where feelings weren't discussed and a premium was put on just achieving and it felt like love was kind of conditional on you doing what your parent wanted. That's trauma, you know? Yeah, maybe it's not the kind of trauma you get being on the battlefield, but it that takes its toll. That takes its toll. And so support groups for all of those issues are great because therapy is great for helping you understand from a clinician's point of view, Mm -hmm. what is going on with you, but it doesn't give you the feeling of being in a room full of people who have your lived experience and a connection. Yeah. And, um, who you can have intimate, uh, conversations with. And that is incredibly healing. Hearing your story come out of a stranger's mouth is really powerful. That's one of the re- one of the things that inspired me to start the podcast was I thought, you know, people are if if people listen long enough on this podcast, they are going to identify and realize that what they're experience uh, what they're experiencing is a real thing and not a weakness on their part that needs to be brushed aside and you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um. Well, the the answer to this question might sound so obvious, but. Um, how did you found them? You the support groups. How did you found them? Uh, I called information and found found a support group. Uh, other ones I found through friends in my original support group. Therapists can recommend them. You can you can. Uh, there's a good resource uh, called helpguide.org. H e l p g u i d e dot org, and they have a list of phone numbers, websites for every kind of uh, struggle uh, that you can imagine. Or just try googling. Yeah, exactly. Just try googling. Um, that's how some people found my podcast. You know, they googled depression or anxiety, and and it came up. If money is an issue, Google, if you, you want to go to therapy and money is an issue, Google low fee therapy in the name of your town or city. Or, and I heard this on your podcast actually, but Talkspace, uh, which is an application where you can find for quite an affordable price uh, a therapist where you can text with unlimited. And betterhelp.com uh, is actually one that I'm telling people about. They're, they're kind enough to uh, sponsor the show and I've been using them and really liking them. So I would recommend betterhelp.com uh, for online therapy. And um, well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I'll link them up on the show notes as well. And I just have a few questions about suicide, if that's okay for you. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's something that you've struggled with as well. And it's something that I have struggled with quite a lot in my past, actually. And the importance of talking about such topics is yeah, so important. 
because the reason why I started talking so openly and I'm sure that's the reason for you as well, but the reason why I talk so openly about these deeper subjects on my podcast and in person with other people is not because I want to make someone feel sorry for my uh, about my past, but because I want to show that that no one is alone actually, because we're all trying to hide the same secret, the same right. secret that everyone has. That's uh, right. Because we all have exactly some kind right. of battle going on inside, right? So it's yeah, it's kind yeah. of funny when you think about it that we're all trying to hide it, though. <laughs> We are. And, you know, the thing we forget is that there are tons of safe, loving, compassionate people out there. And when we find them and we connect to them Feels and we let them know what's going on with us, you know, in a way that isn't, you know, draining them by calling them once an hour, seven days a week. Um, when we open up to them and share with them, they feel honored that we open up to them and it gives them a chance to listen and be of service to us. So you're helping yourself and somebody else. Yeah, it's true. Like many people actually feel happy that you come to them and ask them for yeah. help. Yeah, it gives them a chance to get out of themselves and their obsession with themselves. Yeah. Uh, to come to the questions about suicides, why did those uh, thoughts came to play around with your head? Can you talk? A bit about that i think the depression i think the depression and and feeling yeah feeling like almost a uh well for for one um i had clinical depression and um i needed medication uh, i also needed to stop drinking i also needed some spirituality i also needed meditation i needed all of those things um but uh yeah it it the only way I found out what worked was just trying everything I could one at a time, adding them. And if I felt better, I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep this. And then if uh, I felt like, well, maybe I need to cut something out because maybe it's not working anymore or I don't need it, then one at a time I would try you know, maybe eliminating this pill or this whatever. And and I would find out usually pretty quickly that, no, I needed that. I needed that thing. And, it, you know, if you are on meds and you want to go off them, do it through the care of a psychiatrist, because very often that depression or whatever it is will come in and it will present itself as reality. And so you will not realize that this is the illness You'll think it's reality and you won't want to get help. And before you know it, you feel so bad. You don't care about getting help. You can't bring yourself to get help yeah. and you're caught in that downward spiral. And that's a lot of times I think how people lose their lives. Yeah. Cause that's actually what I wanted to ask you, like, like how did you feel during that time? Like how did the world look for you and what was kind of happening inside of you during that time? It's like I was lost in a sea of depression yeah. and and all I was consumed with was finding little islands where I could bring pleasure to myself. Um, it was never about doing something nice for somebody else. I was not a very, you know, my morals were questionable. It was because I was, you know, my God, like I said before, was bringing pleasure to myself. Mm -hmm. And it's a really empty God to worship. And so, you know, I, I don't believe in a conscious entity as, as a God. It's more like energy. Yeah, I get what you now, mean. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever the source of love and compassion and patience and kindness is in the world, I try to connect to that through actions that prove to me that they work. Apologizing when I need to, trying to be of service, taking care of myself you know, the, the, the list goes on and on. And that's how I connect to that energy. And I wasn't connecting to that energy when I was suicidal. And now I do, and I'm not suicidal. So something works. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, were there actually any attempts that you took? No, nope. no, it was mostly just ideation, but it was about 50 times a day. Mm. And I would, I would think about it. If you were to be another person and you would have walked into yourself like when mm -hmm. you were suicidal, what would you have mm -hmm. done to help yourself? I would have said, buddy, we need to get help. This is, <laughs> this is serious. Um, and my wife had said that to me, but you know, my wife is not, um, well, actually we're separated now. We're 
I'm divorcing, but she she is not a uh, somebody who nags. You know, she will kind of say her piece and leave it that way. And she said um, to me one time, I'm only going to say this once, but I think you have a drinking problem. And she said maybe a couple of times to me, you know, I think I think you need to get help because of your your depression. And she was also saying, I don't think you dealt with uh, stuff in your childhood fully, uh, particularly my relationship with my mom. And she was right about all three of those. And I'm grateful that that she not only told me the truth, but she did it in a way that wasn't um, nagging or, you know, judgmental. It was, you know, concern. It came from concern. On your podcast, Paul, you uh, read service that visitors on your website fill in. Uh, service mm -hmm. about shame and secrets, workplace bullying, body shame, and, and many other ones. How does that feel for you reading them? Because a lot of them are quite heavy and dark things that yeah. people write about as sexual abuse, self-harm, suicidal thoughts. How does that make you feel hearing those stories of, of what people are going through right now or went through? Um, well, I got to tell you, it's a little easier than reading the emails because I feel an obligation to respond to the emails, um, you know, depending on my schedule. Um, but, you know, I try to respond to all the emails and, and those are kind of bear a heavier weight on me than the surveys because the surveys are anonymous. I can't contact that person. So there isn't that feeling of obligation that somebody has to witness this person's pain and let them know that they are seen, um, which is what I feel with the emails. The surveys are, you know, I make sure to not uh, force myself to read them mm -hmm. when I don't want to, because this would be a very, very easy job to get burned out on. And yeah, I don't practice sure. self care. Um, I remind myself that I am not here to save anybody. I can't save anybody. Um, I have to live my own life and the amount of help that I am giving is enough. So I kind of fall back on that so I don't feel guilty that, you know, I'm not doing enough. That being said, you know, you read some shit that just uh, is like, oh, my God, how how is this person still alive? Uh, how how could a parent be so monstrous? Um, it's. It's hard to read sometimes, you know, there's a lot of fucking pain out there, but there's also a lot of beauty. You know, some of the surveys oh, yeah, for sure. are positive surveys like happy moments and uh, awful some moments. Um, and those, I think, are an important part of the podcast because it peppers they're peppered throughout the podcast and remind people that, yeah, you know, uh, there's a lot of beauty in the world that is not hard to access if we can just get centered and look for it. Now, I can kind of assume uh, the answer to this question, but I still like to ask you the question. Why do you read those surface to your listeners? I feel like those are the second guest on the show. All right. Yeah. Um, they share things that most guests wouldn't share out loud because they can be identified. Uh, some occasionally I'll have a guest who will withhold their name, but when you're filling out a survey completely anonymously, people share the really, really big secrets. Yeah, Cause and I feel like I, that, that wouldn't be judged. So exactly. And I think those are important. And a lot of people have had cathartic moments, um, not only hearing surveys read where they realize there's somebody else that thinks that or feels that or has experienced that. But people have cathartic experiences filling out the surveys because they've never put it into a sentence, what they're thinking or feeling or what they experienced. And many, many times people will write, you know, as they're typing a secret out, I'm crying as I'm writing this. I've never, you know, said this out loud before or shared it with, with anybody. And, um, Yeah, so I think they're really important uh, for the show, and I'm and I'm also just fascinated by what secrets people hold near. 
I I know you're not a, a therapist or a psychologist, but you are a person who has had a lot of experience, both personal and uh, experience from hearing it from other guests and, and mm-hmm. from actual therapists and psychologists on your podcast. But for someone who is deeply in a depression right now and who has absolutely no idea where to start into addressing it, what would be some steps of action that you could suggest to that person? Get help. Call a therapist. If you are considering suicide, call a suicide hotline. I don't know what they are in different countries, but if you just you know Google suicide hotline and the name of your country or city or whatever, something will come up. Um, but do not try to fight this on your own because it is too big. It is too big. And you can't fix an unhealed brain with an unhealed brain. Be patient with yourself in the process. It takes time. You know, I've tried a shitload of different meds and I finally found a combination that works. Um, Yeah, it got better along the way, but I finally, at 15 years of seeing a, a, a psychiatrist, feel like I'm on a combination of meds that really works for me. And I had to be patient with myself. Um, There's a lot of hit and miss. Um, don't rule out needing meds. God, I know some miserable people who believe that meds are cheating. And I, you know, my that's to me that's like saying, well, if I try hard enough as a diabetic, I'll I'll produce insulin. No, some people lack chemicals and they need help. I think talk therapy should be tried first and to see if that lifts the depression. And if it still doesn't, then I think seeing a psychiatrist and looking at meds, because I, I don't think meds should ever be the first course if I talk agree. therapy has never been done. Um, but that's just my opinion. No, I agree with that. That's some good advice. I I want to turn things a, a little bit around here and I want to talk a bit about humor and about laughter because... Uh, you're also a stand-up comedian, and you use humor a lot in your podcast, which is an excellent thing to do, especially talking about these heavier subjects. Uh, helps to release some of the density in the conversations. How has um, how much has laughter and humor been of help to you in, in dealing with your struggles and problems, or just generally? How has humor and laughter helped you in your life? Hugely important. Hugely important. You know, if recovery isn't doesn't have moments of fun, I'll get burned out by it. And, you know, if you're if you're in the right support group meeting, laughter is just going to come organically, because when you hear people, you know, when you hear something that you that is kind of screwed up, but you identify with it so strongly, that's really cathartic laughter. And you're not laughing at the person you're laughing with them. It's just it releases a lot of negative emotions. For me, it just does. It, it bonds me with the with the people that I'm having a laugh with. I, I also think in the in the interviews, it's important because just like a movie that's really heavy, you, you know, it, it it needs a moment of levity here and there. Yeah, I I can recommend anyone who feels down in life uh, to laugh more. And of course, you can say that's easier said than done when you're feeling deeply unhappy, which is true. Um, but I once wrote an article uh, which uh, was titled A True Cure for When You're Feeling Unhappiness. And mm-hmm. it goes into the, the incredible effects laughter has on our body and on our mind, which are quite remark- uh, remarkable because laughing boosts our immune system. It relaxes the body. It reduces stress, increases energy. It improve, improves the blood vessels and just so many more things. Yeah. But I also wrote in the article about how comedians are actually professional trained people to help make you laugh. And they are. Mm-hmm. And I listed a couple of comedians. So for anyone feeling deeply unhappy, I would say just watch some more comedy. Uh, it's incredible how laughter can help you. It really can. And, and you know, the right support group. I have probably laughed and cried harder <laughs> in my support groups than I have at any, mo- any movie, any comedy show. It just, yeah, it's, it's essential. Essential. And I've been to some support group meetings where it's really glum and, you know, it, 
I don't go back. I find a different one. I'm, I'm lucky enough to live in Los Angeles where I have a, a big choice of, of support groups. And there's also online groups. Uh, there's a website called uh, In the Rooms. And in the Rooms? In the Rooms, yeah. It's either .com or .org. I can't remember which one. But they have online meetings of just about any... Uh, support group that you can you can imagine that's cool i'll put that in yeah. the uh, show notes i just have uh, two more questions before we uh, close the main subjects and uh, finish this interview with the end questions um if you could go back in time and and give some advice to the young paul what would you have told him that you know would have come to help him greatly i would have said your mom is not safe your dad should be paying more attention to you and you're going to get through this and you are going to be okay. Is there anything else uh, you still would like to add or say about depression, loneliness, or anything about mental illness or something else that we talked about? I don't think so. I don't think so. I feel like we did a pretty good job of covering it. That's great. Dan, Paul, I already want to thank you for sharing your wisdom about these subjects and, and for all the amazing work that you're uh, doing in helping people with mental illness and with being more open about feelings and struggles. Because uh, you felt and changed so many people their life, and I hope you know how how proud you should feel on yourself for doing this work. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, before we finish the interview, there are just a few end questions that I ask every guest here on the show. Uh, your parents' influence. What do you feel your parents taught you well while you were growing up? A lot of things. They modeled living below your means so that you're not financially stressed out. They told me when I was growing up, do something for a living that you enjoy, because chances are you'll do it well and the money will follow. Yeah, that's And true. that was the best advice I ever had. Uh, it, it led to me changing my major in college from pre-med to theater. And now I'm doing what I love doing. And I'm so glad because if they hadn't encouraged me to do that, I think I'd be a miserable doctor <laughs> right now because that's what I was going to be. Or I should, I guess I should say an unfulfilled Yeah, that's uh, better. Doctor. Yeah. And just, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, what would you have liked your parents to, to have taught you differently though? Uh, how to recognize feelings, mm -hmm. uh, boundaries, how to express feelings. I wish they would have modeled what a healthy relationship looks like. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things, you know, but I think they, you know, the cliche, they did the best they could with the tools they had, you know, I think that kind of applies. So I don't, I don't, I'm not angry with them. And, you know, if they hadn't made the mistakes they did, I wouldn't have the meaning and purpose in my life that I have now, because I wouldn't be doing the podcast. If any, which book do you consider to be your personal Bible or what book more than any other uh, has had the biggest impact on your life? I think, you know, other than my support group uh, uh, books, I would say the book A, uh, a New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Uh, that's a good um, one. Yeah, that's a really profound book. Do you have any favorite quotes or um, any quotes that just recently stuck in, uh, with you? Well, there's a thing that I say about... Or depression. something that you say, yeah? Yeah, something that I, I think kind of sums up uh, the stigma of depression and people's battle with giving validity to it is uh, thinking th that you understand clinical depression because you've experienced situational sadness is like thinking that you understand Italy because you've been to the Olive Garden. The Olive Garden is like a mediocre chain of Italian restaurants here in the United States. Um, you know, I love the Gandhi quote. There isn't a path to peace. Peace is the path. That's a good quote. Uh, final two questions here. What words of wisdom, what advice has helped you through your life? Open up to somebody. Yeah. Don't keep it. Don't keep it inside. Find somebody safe and let them know what's going on with you. Because not only will you help yourself, you'll help them because you'll give them a chance to feel meaning and purpose in their life. Before I ask the final question, where can people find and, and connect with you, Paul? Um, the, the website is mentalpod.com. Mm -hmm. 
And um, you can email me at mentalpod at gmail.com. Are there um, any interviews on your podcast you could recommend people to start with or any favorite ones of yours? It really kind of depends on what you're looking for. There's so many. There's 315 episodes. So I would I would suggest typing in a subject that you're interested in in the search search box and see what comes up. Uh, the final question here, from everything that you've seen, experienced, lived, and learned in your life, what's the one thing you know to be true? We're not alone. <laughs> That's definitely true, yeah. Paul, I thank you so much for being here on the show and, and for sharing all this uh, insightful and helpful wisdom. Uh, it's so much appreciated. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. Nice talking. There we have it, guys. I hope this episode was helpful to you. Definitely check out Paul's podcast, The Mental Illness Happy Hour, where he goes way more into the subjects of mental illness, depression, sexual abuse, suicide, and anxiety, etc. It really is an incredible podcast, and Paul is such a a wonderful host. As Paul suggested, have a look through his episodes and play the ones that focus on the issues you are currently facing. Listening to similar stories to your own struggles is an incredible way to learn more and to find solutions, but it will also help you to give some sense to your feelings and, and to help you describe them and put them into words. Show notes and more about what we discussed can be found by going to innerpicturestories.com slash podcast just type in Paul and the episode will come right up and I, I want to say one more time you are not alone and I'm not saying that because it's something nice to say but because it's true if I can be of any more help to you feel free to get in touch by going to innerpicturestores.com slash contact there are people in this world like me like Paul and like so many others that want to be there for you you don't have to do this all alone so if i can be of any help to you please don't hesitate to reach out to me one final thing be sure uh, to share this episode with your friends and family on facebook twitter pinterest etc help me spread this wisdom around so we can help more people who are struggling within themselves Thank you for tuning in and spending some time with me and Paul. With that, I salute you and hope to see you again here on the Inner Picture Stories podcast. This is Jelis Vaas signing off. Until next time, guys.